Good evening and welcome to our extended school year ESY webinar. I am Lisa Mathy, the Training and Administrative Coordinator for Forum Families Forward. And I have Liz Capone, our Special Education Advocate with us tonight. She is going to be covering a very timely topic for us, the end of the school year services and planning for our kiddos who receive special education services. Uh, we are going to be spending about the next hour together going over a lot of some great information from Liz. But before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about Forum Families Forward and some housekeeping. So for tonight, those who have not been involved in any of our webinars, I would like to direct you to the questions pod, which should be on the dashboard located on your screen. That is where you are going to pose your questions and comments. Others will not see what you put in the questions pod, but I will be able to. And as we go throughout the webinar, I will be prioritizing and organizing the questions and presenting them to Liz at the end of the webinar so that we can all hear the answers and benefit from the information that she's sharing with us tonight. All of our recordings and slides and the handouts for the webinar will be under the resource webinars tab on our website. And for those who are in need of a certificate of attendance, you can send your requests to info at forumfamiliesforward.org and I will process your request as quickly as I can. Um, so you can do that. Um, I would like to ask that you do it within the next week or two. Uh, the later that we go from the webinar, the further down in the email chain it gets and it takes a little longer to get to it. So if you need it, please do it in a timely manner. For those who are joining us for the first time, a little bit about Forum Families Forward. We are a family-led resource center in Northern Virginia that supports foster, adoptive, and kinship families raising children, youth, and young adults with special education needs and professionals who work with our population. We offer our free training, consultations to families and events, as well as system navigation. We also offer peer support groups, webinars such as the one that you're participating in tonight, youth classes, videos, and other resources. Most of this information can also be found on our website. And for the professionals joining us tonight, we are a family partner to the Virginia Tiered Systems of Support, which is part of the VTSS project under the Virginia Department of Education. Kelly Henderson is our executive director. She is usually with us tonight, but she is off out in the field providing some special education information to a group of teachers. So I will be facilitating tonight and Kelly and I can be reached at the email addresses provided here on the screen. And uh, if I haven't already mentioned, the handouts for tonight will be posted on our website under our webinar archive. So you will be able to get them uh, a little bit later. As I mentioned, we have support groups for our families. Two of them are the Foreign Families Together peer-led support groups for foster adoptive parents and kinship caregivers. They meet monthly. They are in two formats, virtual and in-person. The virtual group meets on the first Sunday of each month from 7.30 to 9 p.m. And the in-person meets on the third Wednesday of each month on a site in Fairfax City from 7 to 8.30. They are led by trained Forum Families Forward staff and volunteer experienced foster adoptive and kinship caregivers. The registration link is on this slide and it too will be included in the handouts for future reference. We have an event coming up that we're very excited about, the Summer Positive Parenting Class. It's for parents and caregivers of children, including those raising children with special needs. It will be in person. There are two three-hour sessions and childcare is being provided. 
We are also serving lunch and those who attend both sessions will receive a gift card. We are planning to offer a Spanish version sometime next year and information to register can be found at forumfamiliesforward.org. So we hope to see you there. Uh, the class is being held on June 18th and June 25th. Both of those are Saturdays. And with that, I am going to exit out of these screens and I am going to switch over to our presenter, Liz. And I'm going to mute myself and let her take it from there. So Liz, thank you for joining us and providing your expertise tonight on this very timely topic of extended school year services. And I will turn it over. And thank you all for having me present. You probably wonder why you're not seeing a video. Um, as many of you have uh, experienced, DC traffic can be extremely bad in the DC area. So I'm, I'm actually pulled over in my car because I got behind a bad accident so we can pretend we're podcasting it, correct? So in all seriousness, um, I'm really glad to be here tonight and to present on this very, very important topic. And I am going to be showing you some slides and taking some questions. My background um, in this topic includes implementing extended school year instruction, being a case manager, attending extended school year training in more than one county, and also helping as, a, as an advocate for parents as they navigate this process. A little bit about me in terms of how I relate to this group. I did foster care educational advocacy about 20 years ago and then returned to teaching. And then I returned to being an advocate and an expert witness this past fall and I've been doing it ever since. So I'm going to pause a little bit and pull up my slides. So sit back, take notes, and um, we'll go over, we're going to get ready to go over the presentation outcomes. So as you can see, the presentation outcomes are very general in terms of what I hope everybody can walk away with. Um, in terms of discussing the criteria for students to qualify for extended school year or not, what some typical extended year settings may look like, and again may because they're different depending on the groups of students that um, you know make up that group. So of course settings will vary in, in terms of intensity, in terms of services, in terms of the classroom structure, etc. Some school system missteps that um, I've heard about ESY or seen or corrected. And what your data would be as you come to the meeting and you say, hey, wait a minute, I think Jimmy does qualify. I think Sharon would benefit or does qualify. So again, your data is very, very crucial. So we wanna make sure your voice is heard at the table. Um, next slide, please. and I'm gonna make sure I am seeing my next slide, sorry, and scrolling up. Again, I'm doing this on my phone, as many of you have done. I'm sure you've done work calls on your phone as well. Um, so we wanna talk about qualifying during the meeting. And when we have a child coming up, often it's during an annual review. Many times though, it is a separate meeting where the case manager contacts you and says it's time to have that ESY discussion because the annual was in October. Or we're gonna do the annual review and we're gonna discuss ESY. And you wanna be prepared for that. So you want to know the terminology coming in. You don't wanna be asking at the table, what's the definition of this? What do you mean by that? I wanna say that critical life skills, that concept, is so, what's the word? It's very subjective. So if you have a four-year-old who's not yet reading, critical life skills for that child could be very different than obviously for a 10th grader who can't read an exit sign, who can't read the word fire. But that it's not always as cut and dried as those extreme ends of, of the range, if you will. Critical life skills, are they in the IEP, yes or no? And that's a subjective decision that that IEP team has to make. And part of the IEP team is the parent or guardian. 
So when a school system says, well, we've already determined, and we'll get to that, that part in a second, that they don't qualify, you need to be prepared for what they use to determine that and actually say, well, you know what, I would like to go through that discussion. Because when you go through the discussion, maybe they were wrong and they're not supposed to predetermine it anyway, but you need to know all of the terminology. So critical life skills, there's no finite list. You might have an eight-year-old who's working on zipping up their jacket or remembering their address or writing their name or counting money. Those are some concrete examples that teams always will say, well, if Jimmy was just doing this on his IEP, if he was, you know, learning how to zip up his backpack, then he would qualify. So you need to be prepared for what is in your child's IEP that you think, in your opinion, qualifies as a critical life skill for your child. And there's no finite list. This is not a, something where you can go on to a website and go, these are the ESY critical life skills and these are not. Be aware of that. <laughs> Even if your child did not qualify last year, they may qualify this year. And that is the link to the regulations. If you all want to just take a second and look at that slide. In terms of clicking on at some point, again, IDA is driving this decision, not the local school system. They may have policies about ESY, but in terms of who is running the show, IDA dictates what is in ESY and what is in, in terms of those discussions. So how does, how does a student qualify? First, you want to decide, is there a critical life skill in the IEP or not? And often there's more than one, okay? So you really want to have that discussion, know ahead of time what your opinion is on that. Don't formulate your decision at the table. Be prepared, look at those goals. Get really, really into those goals. Take them apart and go, hmm, maybe one of the speech goals. Maybe it's the pragmatics. Maybe they need to be able to communicate with peers. That's a critical life skill. So if they're saying, well, you know, it's, it's not toileting or feeding or, you know, something very severe. No, communication, if that's, the, if that's the situation for your child or if you're helping a neighbor or a cousin or somebody else navigate ESY, if that's a critical life skill in the IP team's decision, then that's a critical life skill. And then you go through some questions. And again, this is not determined by the staff ahead of time. So if you could go to the next slide, please. There are different things the ESY team will talk about. Is there a possibility of regression with no chance of recruitment? Recoupment, I'm sorry. Again, I'll get to another slide later on. You're almost looking into a crystal ball. You're trying to decide, hmm, come September 30th, if my child doesn't have ESY, where will they be? So you're really trying to predict the future. You need to have your data based on prior summers prior years, during virtual learning, those lapses in education, did your child pick up where they left off really quickly or not? That's very key. So that's just one area. Another area is the other end of the spectrum. What if they just got this concept recently? Wow, they're able to zip their jacket. They're able to identify um, key emergency words. If they have this breakthrough in learning, that's another way for them to qualify extended school year. We want to keep that success going. We don't want to interrupt that. If we interrupt that, they could regress. There's also nature severity of disability. That is another category that often teams just gloss over. If there's a child, and again, I'm not going to go into, you know, I'm not breaching confidentiality. I'm not saying what, anything like that. I've worked with children in the past who have a full-time assigned nurse to them. They have critical medical issues. They're working on really key things for their basic day-to-day -day existence sometimes. They're working on holding a fork. They're working on identifying colors. They have a full-time nurse. So if they have a critical life skill, which obviously they do, even if these other questions aren't answered yet, if the nature and severity of that child's disability is such that they require extended school year, then that child requires extended school year. Again, it's a team decision. 
It's not predetermined. It's not walking into this meeting, and if you see that box checked that we've already determined your child doesn't qualify, that is time to stop and have a discussion and click on that link for those regs. Another, another um, situation that's on the same slide is special circumstances. Maybe the child was in the hospital with a broken arm. Sorry, that's background traffic noise. Maybe they just moved to the school district and the curriculum is different. There could be any number, excuse me, of special circumstances that the team with your participation needs to consider. Another one on that same slide, the child's behavior. What if the child's behavior is interfering with their ability to access the curriculum or their peers' ability? Again, this is a team decision. You do not have to meet all of these criteria. If your child has critical life skills in their IEP, and any of these things go on, then your child should qualify for extended school year. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Beware some school system missteps. And again, I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. These are some things I've heard or seen or friends of mine have said over the years. Well, could you help me out with this? My cousin's child was told they can't get ESY. Just look at this um, slide for a second and see if any of these look familiar. So when I say missteps, I'm not placing blame. I'm not saying these are intentional. I'm saying that these are some patterns that you may have seen. You may have seen them say, well, we're only doing ESY this year for fourth through eighth. The first through third, there's no, there's no program this year. Or no, we're not having our kindergartners. Or no, we don't think our 12th graders are that severe that they would need to qualify. Beware of that verbiage because that is questionable. If they say only children in certain educational disability categories qualify, oh, we're only ser serving the children who are, um, you know, found eligible, who were found eligible with multiple disabilities, we're not serving children with OHI or specific learning disabilities this summer. A red flag. I would ask for a copy of that policy very nicely. Say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Could you please give me a copy of the policy? telling you that and then ask for more information. These are things school systems do. I've been in school systems where I was told um, only have three children per every case manager qualify for ESY. And then of course I would think that would sounded sketchy. I would call the union or whomever and say I'm being given information that I don't think is legally correct. And then when you ask for a copy of the policy, there is no copy of the policy because that was just a verbal recommendation that somebody made, I guess, to reduce numbers. Not having a discussion at all, coming to the meeting, as we said, with nothing, um, with it already checked off. You said there was no opportunity. There was nothing occurring in a meeting where you got to have input on whether your child qualifies for extended school year or not. That is a misstep. They have to have that discussion. They have to determine it going through that, that checklist. Um, arriving at the meeting, quoting the central office about who qualifies and who doesn't. This is another one of my favorites. It's, well, we only want to see those children who are three years behind in reading. I remember one school system. We only want to see the children who are this. This school last year, they sent way too many children, so we had to tell them, we want to see kids that are, you know, five years behind in math that have self-contained reading. Whenever you hear, again, these blanket statements that, that disqualify a lot of children, you want to go, hmm, I wonder if that is an accurate summary of a written policy by the Central Special, Special Education staff, or is that somebody trying to lower numbers? Because the, the, I've taught extended school year in more than one county, and I remember I was told at my base school, only send blah, blah, blah type of child. And then I went and taught extended school year, and there were children who were, for example, six months below in reading. And I, I was thinking, well, I was told, this was my second year teaching. It was uh, Maryland County. I was told they had to be three years behind. Hmm. And one school was sending many children on their caseloads the case managers were, and other, other schools were sending only their quote unquote most severe and most, you know, the ones that were the most below grade level. So again, even schools are making different decisions. 
school to school. So that doesn't sound consistent. It doesn't sound um, as it doesn't sound like there's equity. It doesn't sound like there uh, is the same policy school to school. You are supposed to have this discussion. And everybody should have that opportunity to have that discussion. It's a child by child decision. And again, just because they didn't qualify last year doesn't mean they wouldn't qualify this year. So those are just some of the missteps. Um, another one I've heard is, well, our program for this grade is going to focus on this skill. So our program, you know, for third grade is going to focus on math and that child has reading goals. No, it's individualized. If that child has an, a critical life skill, the team has identified it, the team has identified goals to work on, those are the goals that the child has worked on, needs to work on rather. Okay, we're gonna go to the next slide, which is what is a critical life skill? Um, and it depends on the child. So again, you know your child best. You are the expert on what is a critical life skill for your child. So let's move away from the, the concept of identifying the fire sign, identifying the exit sign, identifying, you know, coins. If that really was, was, um, was making sense, if that was the only list of skills that a child would qualify for ESY for, then we would have children all around the country just looking at fire signs all summer, just looking at Exit signs, just counting money, that doesn't make sense. It's about that child and what is a critical life skill for that child. So again, it depends on the child's age. It depends on the child's um, needs. It depends on, is that necessary for that child? And so again, you're the best person to speak up about that situation. And if there's a question about it, you can always say, well, I would like, you know, I think it's very um, appropriate to say, you know, I was a little concerned that the IEP team disagreed with me about what was a critical life skill and what wasn't. I would like, you know, maybe to have somebody from the central special education office come to the meeting and, and provide their put, input. There's nothing acrimonious about that. You're just trying to advocate for your child. So again, this varies child to child. There's no list. There's no saying that all 10 year olds must be at this skill level. And if they're not, they, you know, then they do or don't have a critical life skill. It is not a finite list. Okay, next slide. You want to use your data in this area. And when you think about your data, you want to use all your data. You want to use grades, attendance, homework habits, incident reports, behavior intervention plan data, work samples, teacher emails, progress reports. If you have teacher emails saying that the child needs this much support on this skill over and over and over, and then the team is going, oh, but the child got all Bs, they're doing fine, and you have emails from the teacher saying the child needs to stay late, they need to resubmit the work two and three times, you know that you work with them at the kitchen table, you know the tutor work with them. If that grade doesn't represent all the effort that that child put forth, you need to, you need to, say that data and state that data at the meeting. So yes, this is the data, but what's behind the data? What amount of effort did that child put in? And what if they don't get ESY, where will they be in September? And again, this is an unusual time because we have children who, some of them did well in virtual learning, some of them, some of them did not do as well. You wanna use that data because if they didn't have in-person instruction for that time period, which rarely, you know, who did, then that would have impacted their ability to access the curriculum. So you really wanna use all of your data and you wanna acknowledge you have a lot of data. What I recommend parents do for data, either keep digital data, create a Google folder, put in all of this data, have it handy, Go to dollar store target, grab a three ring notebook or I'm not a three, a spiral notebook, put some post-it flags on there, you know, label one grades, label one page attendance. You know, if your child had to be, um, you know, encouraged every single day to go to school and they weren't confident about school and they had a really hard time getting out the door every day, that's data. That, that's very telling. There's something behind that data. Maybe the child's frustrated. Maybe the child's first period class is reading and they have a really hard time. All of that data needs to go in that team discussion that you need to state for your child. 
The next slide is let's be fortune tellers because this is really what the crux of the discussion often is. Hmm, let's look forward and imagine what would happen if the child does not receive extended school year. What will that look like? Will that child say, I don't know math, I'm a bad reader, I always forget things. Will that child be disorganized with their assignments that require synthesis? Maybe they have trouble writing paragraphs. Maybe they have trouble understanding the main idea, or maybe they have trouble with inferences. If that team thinks that that's a critical life skill, then that's a critical life skill. If you believe that your child will not get back by September 30th or so where they were at the end of this school year, then speak up because extended school year is supposed to be tailored for that individual child. So what you want to do is look ahead. Remember last year. Remember last year in September. Remember the year before that. Remember when they first started virtual learning and there were interruptions even with that with the technology. How long did it take your child to get back to where they were interrupted? Really, that data is so key. Jot some of those notes down. Say, in second grade, this happened. You know, two sentences. In third grade, this happened. And then when you walk into that meeting, you open that notebook, you have that data. That's very powerful. If that team only knows your child from this school year and only teaches your child part of the day, and you obviously know your child all these years, and you see how long it takes them to get back to where they started from every fall, then speak up at that ESY meeting. Speak up because that's the data that drives these decisions. The next slide is ESY is not the same as summer school. A lot of people think it's the same thing. I've also taught summer school. Summer school is very different. And in many counties, you pay for summer school. ESY is part of FAPE, which is free appropriate public education. Free. You don't pay for ESY. You don't pay for the bus. You don't pay for snacks. You don't pay for anything. I know Northern Virginia, has everybody has plenty of money. But still, if somebody says, well, this, but you need to pay. I doubt they will bill you, but if they ever say, oh, we can't do this because of the money, oh, we can't send a speech person to that school. No, I've taught extended school year where I'm in the classroom, the speech pathologist shows up at the door, she points to Jimmy and Sally and Fred, those are all made up names, and says, come with me for speech. Why does she take Jimmy, Sally, and Fred? Because those IEP teams checked off a speech goal and said that's also part of that, ch that child's summer pro or ESY program. So again, if they say we don't have it because of money and, you know, maybe you want to pay for him to go to a camp. And I know last year kind of had a very unusual thing, as we all remember, where one big local system, i.e. Fairfax County, had a very unusual situation where I believe they didn't have enough staff. And so I believe the first ESY session just didn't happen. And then they were trying to, quote unquote, work with families because they knew they were obligated to provide those services and they couldn't for whatever reason. Again, that's not the parents' problem, but it was the parents who had to deal with it. So if they say money, it's not summer school. Some summer school programs charge for various reasons. ESY has no fees associated with it. That's very important. The other part on that slide, look at the bottom of that slide and read that a couple times. IEP goals are already written and implemented. Those are prior goals. When you go into an annual review in March or April or May, and they say these are the goals for next year, and then your child's progress report for me is why comes back, and it's for the prior year, and parents go, why are you working on those goals? Because that is what has to be worked on. You can't work on goals that you've just started on because you don't know if there's a chance of regression or not. That does get a little bit confusing. Sorry, just sipping some water. Thank you. So those are goals that they already worked on. There definitely sometimes is confusion about that. The next few um, slides, I just wanted to make sure that people understood the practical ramifications of what goes on at extended school year sites. Think of like a pop-up school. So you go into whatever school, whatever, you know, let's say Fred Flintstone High School is going to host ESY for 
um, high school age, you know, and Barney Rebel Middle School is going to host ESY for middle school. And, um, you know, Bugs Bunny Elementary is going to host ESY there. What they do is they have an administrator, they have an assistant administrator, they have special educators, they have paraeducators, they have related service providers. Many of them do not work in that building. They do not have technology access in that building other than the IT lab and what and their laptops. They do not have file cabinets. They can, of course, log on to, you know, CSTARS, whatever. Not everybody's in, you know, with that um, IP program, electronic program. But think of it as your child is starting at a new program. This is very, very important because transportation, many transportation challenges are going on in Northern Virginia with bus driver shortages, et cetera. So they have a limited window to get that transportation up and running and get it right and run those routes and make sure your child gets there on time. So new transportation, a nurse. Usually not your child's nurse from your child's school, okay? Um, contact information. Make sure you know how to reach that staff. Often if the high school ESY program is at Fred Flintstone High School, Fred Flintstone High School main office is not the recipient of those phone calls. They have an office down the hall, like a little mini ESY administration office with staff not native or or based in that school rather so you have people who literally don't know where the copier is who are going to tell you where the restroom is who are figuring out where an office is they're going into classes they're setting up just for that time period you have a nurse you have new bus drivers find out how to reach those people you want to find out the schedule too what is the start time what is the end time because it can vary site to site and it can vary summer to summer so you really want to find out what is the start time and what is the end time. Okay, the next slide, transition. Transitions are very important to prepare for for your child for extended school year. Often parents forget this. Your child is not returning to their same school like in August or September when they're starting ESY. I mean, of course, your child's returning to their, their school next year. I'm talking about when they start ESY, they are with different peers. Different staff, they may have some staff in a different classroom or even in their classroom who's from their home school, but this staff coming together is a new formulation of professionals. So you have peers from different schools, you have staff from different schools, you have paraeducators from different schools, and you have behaviors from different schools. So your child may have gotten used to sitting by the door and being the second one from the back and their little friend Sarah sat next to them and they have their picture scheduled to know what they're doing. And now they're starting fresh. They're at a different school with different staff. They have an allergy. They need water. They may forget. I mean, just just think, like, if you're starting a new job and you have all that stimuli coming in, think about your child starting in a new program, new peers, new staff, new classroom. Think about that. And just be aware and prepare them. Talk to them. Maybe show them, okay, you're going to go maybe drive by the building as soon as you find out what school it's going to be. This is where you're going to go for extended school year. When I've worked extended school year and you see the kids coming off the buses at all different times, and then we're like, who's this? Is this Fred? Is this Susan? We haven't met the child before that very first day. Often when I've taught extended school year, I have a binder. The binder has the child's IEP, most recent progress reports, some of their classwork, the parent contact form, maybe some medical information, and that's it. I didn't have their confidential file. I didn't have their cumulative file. I didn't have the office to walk down the hall and go, does somebody know if so-and-so has, you know, a fruit allergy or whatever? So remember, this is a brand new experience for your child. Be able to prepare them. That PE teacher that they went to, you know, for that trusted adult or that paraprofessional who was amazing with them, they may or may not be there. So you really want to prepare them. Miss Sarah's not going to be there tomorrow to sign your notebook, but it's going to be Miss Sally, you know, and I still want you to do a good job. I just really need parents to be aware of the difference in the setting. So let's talk logistics is the next slide. And like I said, you may see some of the staff that was based at your child's school, but, but not. You may have ESY at your child's base school or not. And they set up like a 
pop-up school. Like I said, so those teachers are walking into classrooms that are covered with, you know, blank paper. They're trying to put up, you know, welcome here. They're trying to write on the marker board, you know, welcome Jimmy, welcome Susie, welcome Fred. They're trying to put up some work. That child's walking into basically like a bare room almost. The teacher has minimal supplies often. The teacher is using the IEP from the prior year and working on those goals. Sometimes, and we want to go to the next slide. We want to we want to make sure that you know that everything that's there needs to be there. You want to make sure you're verifying that. So that's really really important. You're preparing your child to go there. You understand the logistics. Let's think about these next two slides about records and what needs to go there and who needs to know. Those hard copies. If you want to call that director and go. I want to make sure you knew they had a nut allergy. I want to make sure you know they have an EpiPen. I want to make sure you know when there's a fire alarm that my child needs advance notice. I want to make sure you know that my child was bullied last year. Hopefully this never happened by a little boy named, you know, Freddie, and Freddie should not be sitting next to him. Those are kinds of things that don't necessarily travel. Well, the EpiPen information, the allergy information should travel, but not all of that. So don't assume that the ESY location has all of that information that, that your base school already knows about your child. And that includes strength. Like if your child really is great at something and they want to share with the class that they love Pokemon Go or that they're a really good artist, let the teacher know. Say it's very important for my child to be able to share during break what they're really good at. That will help them feel, you know, more at home. And again, I apologize for the traffic. Um, so don't assume anything about the setting, what they do or don't know about the child. That's very important. Okay, the next one is, sorry, I my phone was acting a little bit up. Um, transition. Give me one second. File. The records. We're talking about records. Okay. So the teachers are working a partial day. Who is there? I'm on the slide, by the way. Who, what, when, and where? I think that's where we are. Um, we did a couple slides on records. Sorry. We want to know who is there? Who are these people? Are these brand new teachers? Are these people from other counties? I've seen a mix. I've seen where counties will hire special educators from other counties. They'll hire special educators from their current county. And often teachers will say for the, for the ESY that they want to work with a different group than they normally do. So you could have a 10th grade, excuse me, you know, teacher who says, I want to work with eighth graders this year. Or somebody who works with, you know, fifth grade math during the year and they want to do reading. So these are the people, usually they really, really, really want to be there, which is great. Um, they work a partial day. They are not going in and out of a lot of IEP meetings, which is great. Uh, typically just for the schedule for logistics, July 4th usually is a holiday. The hours can vary, the sites can vary, transportation is to be provided. And the data that is collected at the end of the uh, session is, is written up by that staff person, not by the case manager. And often there are the same people returning in some counties year after year who love working together for ESY, but not necessarily. So keep that in mind also. I've seen it where parents call and they want their child's dedicated aid, or it's not called that anymore many times, it's called close adult supervision. And they'll say, why can't, you know, um, Benjamin, who's the one-on-one -on -one person with my child, why can't they be there for, for extended school year? That is a discussion you should have with your case manager because that could be very disruptive if they have somebody else. Now, maybe Benjamin didn't apply to work extended school year to be the close adult supervision staff with your child. So maybe they have, you know, James, who's very well qualified for a child with your profile to be the person who who's doing close adult supervision. Maybe your child needs a change of clothing because they may, you know, they may uh, have like a problem in the summer where they sweat a lot at recess or something like that. I'm just an example. Send a set of clothing. Assume nothing. Assume that they don't know anything about your child 
other than what the base school is sending, and the base school may be sending just the bare amount. So assume that you need to be sort of the bridge, you know, letting them know that information. That's just super, super important. Um, I've seen ESY sites where everybody was meeting, we had our rosters, we're setting up our rooms, and then some of us are like, wait, I don't have a binder for Susanna. I don't have a binder for Bernadette. And those are all made up names. And someone's like, oh, well, Bernadette's binder went over to this other school. She was originally assigned there. And literally, people have zero information on certain children. I've had children come into my programs and then appear that they do not belong whatsoever in the group they were assigned in. That is another thing to watch for, another thing to ask your child when they come home, assuming your child's going to extended school year, whatever summer, if, if they come home and they go, I was really bored, the work is too easy, none of the kids you know, did this, or the opposite, the work's really, really too hard, I don't think I should be in that group, listen to that, because if the ESY site doesn't have accurate data, they're not gonna be programming for your child accurately. They might be focusing on one math skill, one reading skill, one speech skill, and that may or may not have been the one that you really were emphatic about at the IEP meeting that that's the skill that they need to work on for the summer. So be aware that there could be, sorry, I have to start my car again. Be aware that there could be a mismatch and speak up, but, but again, it's not acrimony. Say, oh, I was just wondering for grouping, you know, and do this early on. You know, my child was saying this, you know, is there an opportunity for them to do X, Y, Z? They might need adaptive PE. That could be another thing you can talk about at the meeting. The child comes home and says, I saw the other kids get to go to adaptive PE and I didn't get to go. So call and ask. And again, keep these things in mind during that meeting when you're choosing what your child's gonna work on during that session. So again, we go to the what is taught. Be aware of the worksheet heavy site. If you ask the case manager now, well, what is my child gonna be doing? Are they gonna have manipulatives? Are there gonna be centers? I remember like standing on my head, trying to make things fun for students doing this end of school year because some of their teachers from their base school literally sent a binder of some of the most boring worksheets you would ever see where they're choosing the middle vowel and they're doing this and that. I went to Home Depot, I got paint chips. I was having them, you know, do collages. If they're doing short vowels at whatever age, there's more than one way to assess, uh, you know, assess their knowledge on that. There's more than one way for them to demonstrate mastery. They don't need to be doing worksheets all day for six hours. And if the team tries to dissuade you from having your child go to extended school year by saying, oh, they're just gonna be doing worksheets all day, then you can say, wow, I have some great ideas about manipulatives. I saw an article online about centers. You know, I would love to share that with you to share with whomever is going to be that child's extended school year teacher. Because right now, if you called the school today and said, and your child's already qualified for your extended school year, for example, and said, I would really like to know the name of my child's ESY teacher. They may or may not be able to tell you. Often what they do is they group together right before the session starts. They have three or four days of planning. That on-site administrator has all the IEPs and they literally divvy up the groups based on either staff preference, staff strength, or staff experience. So maybe Susanna, who worked with fourth grade math the prior year, is going to now do third grade reading. And maybe, you know, Ginger, who taught you know, uh, life skills wants to do um, some art, et cetera. So you do have different staff doing different things. But if you are concerned that your child last extended school year or a prior brought home boring worksheets, and that's what the case manager said that the child should be working on, but you know your child is a hands-on learner and they like to make things and they can, you know, build a model of, you know, things that they should find in the neighborhood. They could make um, a little sign that says fire and a sign that says exit and a sign that says help. They could use, you know, art materials for that. Why not? Why not provide that input and say, my child is really a hands-on learner. This is what will help them. Because you, what you don't want is to have extended school year be a setting where there are behavior triggers, where the child is very bored, where the child is simply saying, why am I here? 
I didn't learn anything new. You want that experience. Yes, those are goals that have already been written, but you still want that experience to be uh, very meaningful for your child and, and your child deserves that. So what is taught, that really varies by person to person. And I remember walking around classrooms and seeing like some teachers had, you know, the dog and pony show with, you know, gorgeous, you know, bulletin board trim and all the kids' names. And then you walk literally two doors down the hall in extended school year and there's somebody with a couple paper clips on their desk and some file folders and their names written on marker board. I'm not, I'm not putting that second person down. I'm just saying be prepared for a variety of, um, I don't want to say effort, but for a variety of settings in terms of how invested that teacher is in making that classroom really looking more like a full, you know, regular year classroom versus extended school year. Because again, that's not their home school. They're bringing in their supplies. I would usually have all my supplies in my trunk, like my stapler and my dry erase markers and my art supplies and, and the, you know, the student's name tags and things like that. And I would try to do icebreakers. I mean, I've been at extended school year site. There was one in Prince George's County, just amazing, amazing site. We had a talent show at the end of the summer and there was a disc jockey from WPGC who came and emceed it. And they had not graduation, but an end of year um, certificate uh, ceremony when the kids came on stage and did dance performance. And we're talking about some kids who had no, um, you know, no, people might say their communication skills were very minimal, yet we, we had them doing a choreographed dance for some groups. So again, that experience varies from site to site. It can vary from county to county. Um, the last thing I will talk about before I um, finish is everybody seems to have a lot of questions um, about compensatory services and what compensatory services would look like if their child didn't get extended school year and they were supposed to. Again, I'm sorry for the background traffic. That's really a child by child decision where you really need to have that discussion with your child's team. Um, they can't necessarily put that in a package and go, this will equal what your child should have received because we didn't have staff last year for the first ESY session. So I do, hear questions sometimes like that. I am not an attorney. Um, if you need more information on compensatory services, it is something that, you know, 20 years ago when I did this work before, it wasn't talked about frequently. And now it's all over online. Everybody's like, oh, we'll ask for compensatory. All compensatory is, is an attempt to make up for what the child was supposed to have received and didn't. So sometimes, People will say, well, we can do your compensatory services during ESY. Well, extended school year is extended school year. A compensatory service plan is a compensatory service plan. So those should be two separate things. If your child qualifies for extended school year, that's extended school year. Just like they're not going to go pull your child during math to give them compensatory services for reading that they didn't get last year. They wouldn't be giving your child compensatory services during extended school year if your child qualifies for extended school year this coming summer. So if you have any questions about that, that, that gets a little bit tricky, but I know a lot of parents were very upset because last summer they didn't get extended school year and they wanna know what the school is gonna do about it. That's a discussion for you to have with your case manager at your school with your child's administrative team. I think I went a few minutes over. My last slide says to weigh the pros and cons because you can decline extended school year and not be considered like, oh, I'm refusing services. Maybe your family has a trip planned to your great aunt Sally, you know, in Wisconsin, and you're going to be gone for three weeks. And your child really needs that time to go just be a kid this summer. If you say, you know what, I still want to go through the qualifying process, and then at the end, you can call them a few days later and say, by the way, you know, our schedules have changed. My child won't be participating in extended school year. I'm declining services. And you're not seeing, there's, there's no negative light that should be, you know, you shouldn't be perceived any, in any way, shape, or form negatively that you're, quote, unquote, turning down a service. If you have other plans, you have other plans. It's not seen negatively in a professional case manager's uh, perspective from, from my experience anyway. So I will be quiet now. I'm sure there are questions. 
Um, and I hope you got a little bit out of this in terms of what goes on behind the scenes and what you should say at a meeting. Thank you, Liz, so much for that wonderful presentation in a challenging environment. Um, before I get to the question, I just wanted to remind those who came in a little bit late that if you do have questions, please put them in the question pod located on your dashboard and we will try to get to them. Uh, we do have one question already waiting and the individual asked, what is a BIP or a BIP data? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What is that? I couldn't hear the. What is BIP data or BIP data? Oh, sure, sure. Thank you for the clarifying that. BIP data would be data from a behavior intervention plan. So, for example, if the child has had difficulty maybe following directions, um, I mean, typically you're not going to see some of those in in a behavior intervention plan, um, something like that, where maybe there was or wasn't an IEP goal for that. If you have a child, for example, I've taught in residential, I've taught in an acute setting. If you have a child who's having a really hard time simply remaining in class without acting out, for lack of a better word, or has um, eloping behaviors, or anything that if the, if the team has done a functional behavior assessment and looked at behaviors that are interfering with the curriculum and looked at the antecedent or what's happening before the behavior, and they've put a behavior intervention plan in place, um, I'm saying that data should be part of that discussion on whether or not they qualify for extended school year. It shouldn't just be okay, the goals say this, this, and this, because you're not going to have a standalone behavior intervention plan if that child, you shouldn't, if that child doesn't also have an area of need in the IEP um, addressing that. So if you see a child who is, an, is eloping, for example, or has difficulty not you know, speaking back to an adult and has some difficulty with compliance or has some difficulty with safety, whether they're throwing objects or hitting or self-injurious. These are all sort of extreme examples. And there's an IEP goal related to, you know, the child will, you know, reduce the loping. Of course, we want zero loping because that's a safety issue. If they say that's not a critical life skill, I'm not sure. I mean, that Again, it's an IEP team decision, but that data on how often that behavior's, you know, occurring, that is key data. And again, when you look at the checklist for does the child have a critical life skill and then yes or no, and then are there interfering behaviors? So you then you go to the behavior intervention plan. You go, wow, there are, or there wouldn't be a behavior intervention plan. And then you use that data. How frequent is it? How intense is it? how um how problematic is it if a child throws a you know paper clip off of their desk once a month that's not a you know when they say a child's throwing things that's different than a child throwing a chair every day during art because they don't want to draw so really look at that data and say wow how is that impacting the child's ability to access the curriculum and then it does become a critical life skill because it's interfering with their ability to learn i hope that answers the question all right thank you for that the next question often summer school and esy are combined at the same site is that okay you know, it's interesting logistics wise, I've been in buildings where that's happening and it can or can't be problematic in terms of the leadership and how that's going. Because it's interesting, um, I consult with attorneys in different states and I do cases in different states and I was talking to an attorney the other day um, who I happened to connect with briefly in a state out west. And he, he was talking about extended school year. And again, I'm not a lawyer and this isn't legal advice, but he says he always wants his clients to have their children have opportunities to be educated during extended school year with non-disabled peers. So again, so if you look at summer schools down the hall and ESY is in this room and all the children in ESY, 
or on an IEP, then you may have adaptive PE and phys ed and art where maybe they're combined. So in terms of problematic, I could think logistically that there could be concerns in terms of buses and, and um, you know, attendance issues with, you know, this person, this group comes through this entrance. On the flip side, in terms of the least restrictive environment, it would give some children the opportunity to have those, those interactions with non-disabled peers. So I could see both of those things happening. I think it depends on the administration and the implementation. And maybe it's, okay, this school has, I know I've been in schools where I've heard, okay, we're gonna have both ESY and summer school in this building. And then we'll, they will literally, it was a it was school in Howard County and I was doing summer school that year. And I remember going, oh, well, I'm, at a, I'm not even at this site. I'm at a different site. And we had students on IEPs in summer school also, and then some students were in ESY at different sites. And it would be like, okay, we're gonna have on the third floor and the fourth floor, it's gonna be these classes for summer school. And then over in this wing is gonna be this. And then you have more administrators on site. You have more staff capability if there ever was an emergency, like in the lunchroom. And you do have certain opportunity for interaction. So I could see that it would go either way, but if your child is going to be at a site where there are going to be hundreds of children for whatever reason, and that is gonna be problematic in terms of crowds or their you know, sensory issues and things like that, definitely give a phone call for that. I do remember one year in summer school, there were some friends who were seated at a table and they were doing inappropriate whatever, it was high school, I don't think any of them were on IEP, uh, IEPs, and the paraeducators there were very young and not that confident, and so I'm like, well, I need to go sit and have lunch with these friends because they, they need to have their behavior changed a little bit, and I remember going over to them, and they're like, you don't need to sit with us, and I was like, hi, you know, but I am going to sit with you, and it was so that, you know, for those other students who were sort of concerned about those problematic behaviors, yes, that could be an issue. Um, there could be some logistic issues. If there are specific issues, again, about your child and new groups and crowds and, you know, sensory issues, and they, they do fire drills in the summer, those things, and maybe nobody knows your child or knows to, you know, go take them out ahead of time. Those are some things to think about, sort of the, the disadvantages of, of those combined settings and the advantages. Okay, and we have time for one more question, and this question focuses on transition goals. Do transition goals qualify for ESY? For example, uh, a student has the ability to drive as a goal. Can they put that student in the school's driver education program as part of ESY? You know, that's, an, that's a great question. Because obviously, as I said at the beginning, it depends on the age of the child. It depends on the present levels of the child. It depends on the goals for that child. And I think transition goals and objectives have often been something where the team goes, okay, we know that, you know, um, Savannah really wants to, you know, work in a pet shelter and she's very interested in animals and she's going to fill out a resume and she's going to do some career searching online and she's going to volunteer at a pet shelter and we're done it's like a five minute turbo thing and we're done it really shouldn't be that way transition is so important if you have a child and some children and some adults they're receiving services past their 18th birthday as the law you know permits they haven't gotten their diploma and driving and being independent, I mean, if we look at, for example, the state of California with the Lanterman Act, I encourage everybody to, to look at that at some point, the Lanterman Act, L-A-N-T-E-R-M-A-N. It's an amazing set of principles and, and rules and goals for people with disabilities on their rights. They have a right to privacy. They have a right to social interaction, to making friends. And, and driving, to me, will make certain students so much more independent. So if you have a child, for example, who lives in downtown DC and the parents both walk to work and the student's very comfortable taking Metro and driver's ed isn't on the top of their list, that's not the same as a child who literally, that could be the difference between them going to their 
um, place of employment or not. They're feeling independent like one of their peers or not. So I really encourage whoever wrote that question to look at the data, look at the long-term goals for your child and go, what is a critical life skill? And, and really take it to the team and say, for my child in this situation, here is the reason why this, this, and this. And what if they don't get this? What if all of their friends are driving? What if they're the ones that are taking, you know, whatever bus or riding their bicycle to their sheltered work or their regular work or whatever? What if, what would happen if they didn't get that? What would the impact on that child be? Maybe that child has a recent breakthrough. Maybe there are special circumstances. Maybe that driving that car would do so much for that child and open up such a world of confidence and independence that would impact how they interact with all of their other classes and their staff and just give them like, wow, I have my driver's license. So really, it's supposed to be an individualized case-by-case -case discussion, and I think that's an amazing question to bring to the team and really have the team sort of say, why not, why, why wouldn't it be, really? And, it, and again, it's child-specific, it's need-specific, but looking at those circumstances and really think about the end game, the long game. What if that child doesn't have that opportunity? What are the ramifications? Will they then go into class and not be as confident in their peers and not feel like they fit in and not have that opportunity to go get that part-time job. That's really, really crucial to think about. That's such an excellent question. Awesome. I'm glad that you were able to um, answer it to some extent um, with it being so important to our audience members. Um, that brings us to the end of tonight. Liz, thank you so much for spending the hour with us and sharing all that you did. Uh, just to remind the participants, the handouts will be available on our website under our webinar tab on the, again, on the website. Uh, you will be receiving a follow-up email that includes a link for the evaluation of tonight's webinar. I would really, really, really appreciate it if you would take a few minutes to complete the evaluation. It helps us in providing data to our funders on the programs that we provide to our families. And uh, I'd like to ask that if you aren't already doing so to follow us on all of our social media platforms to get the latest and greatest information that we have about upcoming events and resources. And with that, I will close it out again by saying thanks to Liz for your time. And I hope everyone has an enjoyable rest of your evening. So with that, good night. Liz, again, thanks. Thank you for having me. I appreciate and it. We will follow up soon. Have a good night. You too. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.